public company. Um, have my own startup. I've been part of a startup that was acquired before. Um, and like you mentioned, I was four years in the intelligence unit in the Israeli army. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a very different ways of manage and operate, um, you know, people and work. And as you can imagine, a startup life, a public company life, um, and, the, and an army life are quite different. Uh, but funny enough, they're, they're, they're all very similar in, 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 in the same way because they're all about people. And it doesn't matter if you have a manager, a co-founder, or a commander, you know, at the end of the day, um, moving forward, creating, you know, creating progress and, and, and using technology still needs to go through people and still needs to uh, align with what people uh, care about. And so um, going through those things, you know, was very clear to me that something is missing in enterprise software. And, um, and that's kind of where Tonkin is. But uh, we'll talk about Tonkin at the end of this session as well. But I think we'll spend the majority of of it, or at least the you know the, the bigger first half um, on just change management as a whole. Perfect. You know, I like to. If anyone knows me, uh, Saggy, I like to personalize things. You know, I get them to know one another. But the, today's topic, from fighting fires to drive an impact, Saggy's going to bring us on a journey like for innovating without change management. Uh, and just to, to look at the agenda really quick, you know, he's going to jump in. We, we give him the open remarks, the keynote. We're going to do about a one minute demo, keep it quick, and then open it for QA and, and any closing remarks at the end. But, uh, you know, with that, Saggy, I'm going to let you take it off. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I think, um, I think we're actually going to start with a quick, uh, with a quick uh, survey or a poll. Um, you know, we, we're talking here about, managing change and you know the cost of change management and obviously um we're focusing on legal and so from the people you know that attended today would love to hear you know what is um you know what is the percentage of of, of cases where an initiative or a project you know literally got scrapped or been massively delayed due to the amount of change it was required so you know just a small pulse check would you know would go a long way here so maybe give 20 seconds for people to answer <laughs> there's yeah. more dance yeah <laughs> i think people have it up to here with voting you know in yeah voting. something like that you do what you have to do with uh with those uh strange times So can you see it live right now? I guess I can only if I submit myself. So I can share the results right now. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, it looks like um it's actually across the across the map. Um the list amount is where uh it didn't impact at all, right? And so I think um I think that the what we've usually seen across the board, you know, different audiences is is that actually 40, 50 percent mark um, is where uh, where a lot of uh, a lot of the projects fall through, and so that basically means even if you go on the lower hand, um, if one out of three uh, projects uh, is being jeopardized because of the amount of change needed, it means that. We we probably can improve the way that we designed the um, the project to begin with to to include change, um, and so that's kind of where you know where I wanna where I wanna take everyone in. So um, the first thing that I think is important to kind of talk about is is priorities, and a lot of times you know in life, but definitely you know in, in work, priorities are what drives decisions. And so when you think about legal specifically. There is this inherent conflict, in a way, between what it means to um, drive the business for, forward, so you know, being a, a, a business partner um, and, and drive the top level of business metrics, but also doing what we're actually hired to do, which is managing the risk and exposure for the business, right? And so those two, some, so, so many times, are conflicting. And when you think about what it takes to actually um, create uh, impact or drive impact or drive innovation, 
um, we found that this is harder than, than it should be. And a lot of the business processes are still manual. And this is something that you know ties back directly to that change management that, that, that we'll touch on in a second, which is why are there so manual? Um, going back to you know calling point earlier of my experience and coming from the army and going to a startup and going to a big company and back to a startup, I realized something that sort of made me um, go in this journey was that business process is actually not about data. They're about people. And that small and simple concept is actually not trivial because a lot of the work we do, when you think about contract processes, risk management processes, um, handling requests, um, we always tend to think about and maybe driven to think about um, designing the processor and using technology around it from the eyes of what is the data um, that is being handled, where does it need to go to, and, and so on and so forth. And not enough times we're realizing the dependency, that the deep dependency that it that we have inside of the process of the people, and that, that the people in the process are actually, can be in multiple departments in multiple areas and are very, very different. And something I like to say a lot is that there's a difference between the ROI of an individual and the ROI of the organization. So as a team, as a company, as an organization, we might have um, some goal and some um, uh, in, in, you know, uh, metric where we go and, and invest, right? So the ROI is return over the investment that we're measuring ourselves for and the reason we're changing the process. But that doesn't mean that it will align with the ROI of the of the individual. And so um, that's a big part of it. And we'll touch further on that in a second. But the second point here, which is goes side by side with it, is the, fair, the fact that every business is extremely unique and every process is actually very personalized. So even if everyone in the audience here has an NDA uh, process involved, um, it actually might be um, not that uh, similar. Um, it might have the same concept, the same sort of uh, high level goals and, 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 and mechanisms, but the details of like, when do we auto approve an NDA? Where do we use our paper, their paper? You know, who are the people that usually request an NDA? Why do we even need an NDA? You know, what are the type of parties we're working on? All of those are, are very derived by the type of business you do, you know, the type of culture you have, um, the industries you work in, and so on and so forth. So that even that simple process um, seems trivial, is very unique for every company. Um, and then if that's not enough, the, the way that we work um, was mistreated from the impact uh, each department has on the, on the entire business. Um, and this just to say that, you know, I've been part of it too, right? We are, you know, in a silo of our own world because there's so much to do and there's so much to work on. And most businesses work that way. So every department are you know running their own sort of lane and the handoffs between them, um, it, you know, is, is sometimes diff complete different tools, complete different priorities, complete different, um, uh, even culture or, or um, social sort of like standards that really drives the communication to be heavy on manual back and forth over email and stuff like that. So when you think about legally now, you know, in this case, we're, we might buy different software and different tech to help with our internal needs. Um, but if we are taking that NDA example, um, if we only think about what is the value for legal by provide by automating an NDA or by you know standardizing an NDA process, we're completely missing the mark because if if sales in this example are the one that's asking for NDAs, what do they need uh, in order to get the NDA faster? What do they expect? If uh, if finance needs later, you know, to for the diligence to have those NDAs organized somewhere, how do they map that? Um, and, and so on and so forth. And this is obviously NDA is just an example, but this can be any contract, any process, uh, and it's not unique to legal, which means that every uh, process in every department is not 
actually lives in a silo. It's bar- part of a bigger operational end-to-end that actually spans across. And if we don't design it that way, if we don't, if we're not aware of it, and we don't have the right tool sets to do that, um, then we actually find that we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort in trying to solve a process with a very, very low results at the end of it because we were designing it for the, when we, we were ignoring all the different people that are involved and therefore um, uh, pay the tax on the actual handoff. Um, an obvious example for me is, you know, a lot of you obviously spend a lot of time at one point creating a legal portal and, you know, thinking, hey, instead of having all of those legal requests coming in, randomly into our email let's have a legal portal you know everyone in the organization would be able to look for the information they need you know fill forms and all that stuff this is this is great idea for a knowledge management perspective but where it's lacking is the actual intake itself um if an engineer manager need you know a request about an employee agreement somewhere you know in the company or a partner need an information or a salesperson need a, a, you know, a contract or an MSA or an NDA, whatever it is, those people have different front doors. They have different reasoning, the part in their life that needs the contract or, the, or, or, or working with legal is very different um, between themselves and with what legal lives day in, day out. The change management tax come from not being able to uh, prioritize and design the solution to work with those people. Um, and so, again, a, a little bit more visual example into where we see those happening. But that's just one example. You know, this actually, in this slide, I have 40 different processes that are all aligned and intertwined. And this is just because how much I could fit into this one slide. There's probably hundreds of those. And they span across different departments in different uh, times within life cycle of a business. Um, but they're all intertwined. And if we live in a silo, if we're not realizing the relationship, um, then that's when we're paying heavy tax um, on um, scale, on efficiency, and on change. Um, and that's kind of sort of lead me to the last part of, of, of this section, which is what are the alternatives, right? So what we're finding um, from a lot of work we did with a lot of companies and um, our understanding of the market is you know when you think about how do you create alignment there's actually not a really good answer um you can try to do what you know 10 20 years ago uh people were pushing for hey let's put everyone under the same you know place under the same space under the same application um you know the salesforce and the oracles and the in sap's of the world um definitely provide alignment on the data side of things but it's very hard to fit to every individual need and that's again going back to the difference between data and people right and so when people are working their you know their day-to-day um, workflows they have unique needs um, that will cater to their ability to be more productive and that created a situation where when SAS came out um fill that void um everyone buy their own single app. If you have a slightly different UI that you want, a slightly different you know, logic that you want to go ahead and buy a new application and a new uh, SaaS application because n- one single app just doesn't work. It doesn't fit everyone's individual need. The, the second option would be, okay, you want something specific, you want something tailor-made, let's build it for you. So the bigger companies has you know, access of, of engineering resources and you know they always prefer to build versus uh, buy but that's actually a shortcoming too uh if you build something first of all it's more expensive obviously but then you take away from the things that you might uh, are going to be more core to your business and your skill set and specialities but it also results in the same problem of buying one single app because by the time this build thing is done the requirement might change the the environment change and so now you're again in the short uh, in, in um, coming short on what the people actually need in order to uh, create uh, and be productive. And so that's uh, not a scalable solution as well. The third option um, is a very, very common is, okay, all I need is connecting the data. And I think 
by now it's it's clear my position in which the data is great it's important but it's not enough and if you want to visualize it um, even when you connect let's say your crm with your clm with your finance uh, erp whatever it is you're still finding that a lot of the work happens in email or in chat a lot of the back and forth because creating the ticket is not the problem the problem is how do i triage it correctly handle it correctly what happened if there's missing information i need to go back to the person um how urgent this is you know i don't have the visibility i don't have the context again going back to the point that it's not about putting the data around it's about orchestration of a process that is across different departments and there that sort of leads to the last point which is what this entire um webinar is about changing people behavior right if i can change the tools if i can change um the requirement then maybe i can force people into a new behavior sometime you should do it right you should not try to main, hold on to a bad process if the process is bad you should probably change it but sometimes the reason why you're trying to change a process is not because the that part of the process is necessarily bad you're trying to change it because you don't have a visibility. You're trying to change it because um, some areas of it are taking longer than usual, taking more resources than they should. That doesn't mean that the, 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 the inherent process is bad and forcing change on everyone is not only very expensive, sometimes it's not even possible. And according to your guys' votes, um, it looks like there's a consensus of at least 20% or 30% of the cases it, it, it hurts the, the, the project so much that the project might never happen. Um, so, you know, managing change is actually um, a, a core problem here. And so what can we do? And that sort of like um, touches on, you know, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those problems. So this is, um, I think, um, was, the, was the previous uh, poll this is a, this is a, a new poll right so before i jump into sort of what is the uh some some ideas of what can you do right we, i want to make those sessions as actionable as possible let's do a quick pulse check on what is the the things that you guys found uh to be most um that, that if you try the most you know when when you're trying to create alignment was it moving everyone to the same app was it creating homegrown solutions connecting all the data or was it just relying on changing people behavior um, so let's give 10 seconds for that and then we can uh, we can continue Okay, so this actually turned out to be um, a lot of people voted, but uh, quite uh, quite all over the place, which is which is quite aligned with what we've with what we've seen, um, and all of them are usually not good enough. Um, so as we go back to the um, to the slides, uh, what can we do? So there's actually four things I wanna I wanna touch on, um, and some of them are things you can do tomorrow. And doesn't require uh they're more of a, a of a conceptual um change uh into how we think about change <laughs> but also some of them are um, a little more um designing and investing differently in the technology stack and in the uh, methodologies that we use in order to um to create uh, innovation and change within uh, within legal so the first one is actually something we call uh, people first process design. Um, and it's this concept um, that it came really early with when we started talking as, a, as, as to what is the actual gap? And when we think about the ROI of the company versus the ROI of, of the individual, that's actually where this comes in. So this is actually empty, um, purposefully empty because it's, it's, it's more of like this simple, very easy concept of how to design a process uh, people first. And we call it the, the two pillar approach. We actually have a, a, a white paper on this if, if anyone is interested, but the, the idea is, is very straightforward. When you design a process, when you have right now projects on your plan to change, you know what the reasoning from the company perspective, you know what the business impact is. Otherwise you wouldn't do this project to begin with. 
make a make a stand into creating another column next to it writing down who are the different personas across the board that would need to participate in this um, and ask yourself why should they care like what's their own um part of this and what do what drives them um in as part of this process because you'll find that those that you might have a couple of them already in 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 your head when you were thinking about this but there might be a, a long tail of uh, several more that you didn't actually think through what it would mean to them and all of a sudden you're realizing that that person um joe whatever doesn't actually touch this process more than once a month and so actually expecting them to log in and to learn how to use you know this new system or this new form or this new whatever approach uh, is is more likely to not happen as well as you want and maybe that becomes a bottleneck into your uh, ability to create velocity so this simple approach we've seen so many times create all of a sudden uh, these new insights um, that are easy to do and, and can be very impactful in the success of the project. Um, next um, is somewhat, somewhat, somewhat sort of derivated by, by, by thinking people first, but it's actually a little bit um, mind shift into um, how we think about technology. Um, we got used to think definitely in the last 10 years, but that's been around for a while, even in the consumer world, you know, with, you know, uh, iPhone and Android, whatever, to have think in the, in the, in the language of apps. You know, I have something that I need to solve. There's an app for that. I have, you know, I have this gap. Let me look for a vendor for that. That, uh, idea is true for, for some cases in cases you need the very deep expertise on a certain matter, but it's actually pretty bad practice for everything else. And understanding that um, that not every solution means a new application would actually free you into thinking about what is, again, what are, is the ROI of the people. And um, there's plenty of ways to do that today. And this is more than just, um, you know, sort of like we, what we stand for. Um, but the ability to think through, you know, what is the relationship between the different departments what tools do I already have and how can I leverage them more to fit what I need and um, customize some of them to do more uh, versus, you know, going the easy way out of buying something that is prepackaged, right? A lot of times we're like, oh, I don't want to mess with this. Uh, I just prefer to buy this, this thing that is already uh, built for that. Um, but when, com when companies charge you per user their incentive is to have more people using it which means their incentive is that more users within the company would change their ways in order to learn this new application and so it's not a it shouldn't be shocking to anyone why the uh, and i think gartner came up with those numbers but why the average worker today knowledge worker today spends uh, work across 200 applications um you know, within their week. And so it's crazy, you know, or, and 60 plus within a day, something, something crazy that, that, you know, when you actually put it into number, it's ridiculous. Can we limit that? Can we uh, shrink that time into focus on actual high value work? Limiting the number of interfaces is actually critical. Um, so that, that, that is very connected to, to that first point. Cause when you know what people care about, then you can actually optimize to the tools that they already have. The next one is actually about um, dependencies. And for me, dependency, the, uh, the, the opposite of dependencies is empowerment. So how do I actually reduce the IT and dev dependency and empower the rest of the organization um, to move faster? Um, all the while, obviously, going back to that previous point, understanding what do IT care about and then what the business cares about. Um, so what, something that you know that, that you know we didn't came up with. This is a trend that has been going on for a while now. Is that concept of um, of, of no code or low code um, 
it's the concept of configuration and the concept of uh, adapting into some of the uh, the existing uh, existing uh, software and tools. But it's really all about, to me, investing in operation teams. And obviously, you know, uh, a lot of the people in the audience are from uh, our legal op operators and um, and in and, and those legal ops teams. Uh, but that's true, by the way, on all the different operation teams, whether it's sales operations, marketing operations, finance operations, HR operations, and of course, legal operations, investing and empowering the operation teams is critical in order to be able to get that speed and reduce that dependency. And so what it means to me is what are the things that I can invest in? Um, and those can be, like I said, uh, technology, but it can also be training and it can be, um, uh, you know, who are we? Who are we adding to the team? How how are we stuffing the operation team? How can I create a situation in which the operation teams has what they need um, in order to own the logic and own the process while con maintaining the IT team with um, the control and standardization um, and stability? which they care about. And so um, that concept is a more is, is less of one thing you can do. You can do a lot of things, but thinking as a leader of how I can continuously invest small and big into enabling my operation teams and, and, and by reducing that dependency is going to be critical in your ability to uh, reduce change management and create innovation later. Um, so that that is you know from from a high level um, a lot of uh, actions that we've helped companies with and seen companies with and learned from 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 companies um, that worked for them and, um, and and that's something that you know I've seen in my own eyes um, make a huge difference. Um, the fourth one is speaks a little bit about what we do as a company as well. But before I go there, you know maybe Colin. If you want to jump in real quick and you yeah. know because you have a lot of experience in this and so i can go back to the slide that sort of like summarize this mm -hmm. um and, and maybe share a little bit of what you've seen and and whether you uh whether you've seen those type of things work before yeah so j just kind of listening to your last points like i, I just kind of see like what you're offering like is an efficiencies of scale like you know it, it your, your 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 solution what you're aiming for in my eyes is I, I particularly look at legal operations through four lenses. When I'm when I'm building out a new function, there I'm looking at the process. What is the process to the business? You know, what is the process with outside counsel? How am I intaking and tri triaging information? How can I do that smooth, smoothly and effectively? M my thought process at this point is like, you know, where do I automate? You know, where where, where can I where, where can I automate? Where can I communicate better? How do I stand standardize? certain documents you know is there a workaround solution when, when can i use like what if then logic scenarios to kind of create more efficiencies where i'm not touching documents for high volume you know high volume low risk stuff and and move moving it efficiency efficiently across the legal department and, and, and the rest of the business and, and the next thing i'm looking at adoption of technologies which is always like a big change management thing right so I feel like you're kind of you're speaking to something that are like massive pain points within legal to begin with. The other thing is like the spin optimization, right? It's like you're looking across all these doc, you, 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 all these process communications documents. You're you're able to move resources efficiently into the right places, right? So you're kind of legal spin management. You know where to hire. You know how yeah. to deal with outside counsel. You're you got better. You got more time to deal, deal on your billing. So I see, in theory, what I'm seeing, what this does, it solves a lot, a lot, a lot of the problems. And not only that, it manages and measures everything across the process, what you're doing, if there's any blips, you know. So that's, yeah. you know, that that's just my take, you know, from what, from what I, I, I've, you know, I, I've, I've had the demo for 20 minutes. I've talked to folks that use you and, you know, and, and your presentation. I'm just trying to, surmise sur surmise it you know but that's that's my thoughts i see it as a massive value add and reducing those dependencies on it 
it, it, it is, you know, it's been the bane of my existence for, you know, the past 10 years, like, you know, putting big enterprise solutions in, you know, being socked to, gone flying, yeah. you know, and then and then looking for everything to be done and by IT if you need to configure six radio buttons, which could take yeah. you three months to get approved, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I'm not kidding when I say that, right? So yeah, I, I've heard companies that uh, that IT literally charge them money, uh, like sixty thousand dollars to change uh, configuration, and it's gonna take them a month. Um, yeah, I've, I've, yeah. Seen, I've seen it all. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that 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 is a great point. And thank you for thank you for jumping in, and and actually thank you for for the segue because that's kind of where I wanted to, and I know a lot of people joining wanted to hear a little bit more about Tonkin too, and and what we offer, and so. Um, for me, the, 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 there's this concept of orchestration, and it's that um, blanket that you would put on uh, in, in an empowered legal op operation, for example, to control their own destiny, control the logic, connect to existing systems, and so on. And so, something we call an, an adaptive business operation, because the the, the 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 point is being adaptive, and the point is um, improving business operations. And so, um, Tonkin is basically a platform that allow uh, that is perfectly purposely built for operation teams and allow them to orchestrate the mix of people process and systems and so it's really about you know how do i think about the process how do i think about the people in them but how do i think also about the tools that i already have how do i enable um, all of this with no code so people you know the operation teams can actually be the one um, leading the charge versus uh, needing to um, to rely on engineering um, but if I do that, and if I do that the right way, then I actually can create new processes, new efficiencies and innovation without changing anyone's behavior or very minimum into a point that, you know, a person that still did want to sit in their CRM, they can still do that. P person that, that uh, want to live in Outlook or in an, or in, in an email can continue to do that. You can work with external parties. You can work with internal parties and all of that without forcing anyone to a new UI and a new application. And so that's sort of like where we strive for. So to touch on a few of those points really quickly, um, you know, Tonkin basically uh, allows you to first and foremost connect with the existing tools and data. So this can be anything from um, your, you know, ap uh, applications you use every day, um, like your CLM, your, your CRM, your ERP, your HR systems, whatever it is that, that, that is needed, compliance systems, um, or it can also be databases and spreadsheets. It can be a custom uh, internal um, uh, tools that, that are built internally in-house. Tonkin is able to connect to all of those um, in a secure manner, in an, in, and there's a lot of encryption and privacy uh, controls that IT loves because it gives them control over what is accessible and by who. Um, but that's kind of where they their job is ending. Um, the second part of it, which is uh, you know as important, is the ability to connect with the people. And so, uh, if we talk about change management and or or reducing or removing change management, it's all about reaching people wherever they are at the right time. Um, and so, the ability to coordinate with people, so knowing to when to follow up, how much to nag someone, you know. What, what to do when um, when someone is not answering? Should I escalate it? Or uh, how urgent is, is, is this thing is? And being able to work over email or over chat, like Microsoft Teams, Slack, Google Chat, and so on, um, it's a very, very key part of handling complex human-centric processes like legal have. And so being able to connect to the data from one hand, but then being able to execute approval cycles that are just you know, go his hand to hand and then go back to make some more actions automatically, uh, it's a big part of, of what you can do with Tonkin. Uh, all of this eventually has to um, be built on some sort of a workflow. And so Tonkin is, like I said earlier, is 100% no code, which means that the workflow, the way you build the workflow, the way you manage the workflow is actually done by the operation teams. And there's a lot of abstractions that we added there that um, that re remove complexities from what uh, usually is being done uh, in those scenarios. So we don't even talk about you know if this then that. We talk about in cases like when something happened due, because human-centric processes are not linear. 
there might happen in you know in in different times and a lot of the complexity that comes with managing data um like mapping data and so on are completely automated in Tonkin. so you know i won't have the time to go through all of this but the takeaway should be this is built purposefully for operation teams so this is the first time that um that we build a hundred percent someone built a hundred percent no code um there is no way to write code so it's not like oh you can do more things but then if you want to do something complex you have to write scripts for it that's not the case the only way to build things in Tonkin is by this drag and drop and so we spend a lot of time and effort into optimizing for what the, the level of um of if you know how to use you know formulas in in in, in excel spreadsheet and pivot tables then then you're well equipped to build things um and maintain them with Tonkin and the last part but definitely not least is Colin you mentioned something about that is the ability to have visibility to it because orchestrating a process doesn't only mean executing uh actions or coordinating um actions it's also about creating this standardization and visibility if you think about um from a f like if if i compare it to a factory right it's like having an assembly line the assembly line doesn't only allow things to go through in a certain rate and in in the right uh flow it also creates visibility into now being able to optimize it so for example how long does it take us to handle a certain contract request how long does it uh, take how many times this department asks us these questions how many uh, how many times um, the things are stuck on 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 a, on on outside uh, console or whatever it is, All right? So the visibility to it to be cross-functional and across different tools and departments is something that is key in order to create velocity and therefore part of of what we decide define as orchestration. Um, and so just to summarize this and then go and well, we can show a quick demo um, that we prepared because I want to leave enough time for for Q and A is you know those four pillars um, is what we define as um, an orchestration platform um, in, in an adaptive business operation platform one is the ability to orchestrate the process with no code so no code is extremely important to empower the teams the ability to connect to existing systems is what allows us that concept of not introducing new interfaces not introducing new applications reducing change management because of that as well um, but the real sort of like pivotal point about no change management means that if people only can, need to interact with email let's have them interact with email and i don't mean email notifications i mean actual interaction so they can reply to the thread in natural language they can actually work the way they used to work with a with a person it's only now that this doesn't have to be done by a lawyer that you know that has a lot more important things to do than you know replying to um random email email request or question uh, and then the last again is that concept of the end-to-end -end visibility and that's what actually finally allow us to break the silos and see through um uh, you know see through the end-to-end -end operation and improve that over time um with that i think you know uh we i think we prepared a quick demo video just from the sake of time um it's not it's it's a it's a couple it's a couple minutes and I think it would show us and i and i can overlay a little bit of a voiceover too um but we we'll take one of examples around legal document generation and kind of touch to some of those ideas and most importantly how this is not a change management doesn't require judgment if you do it that way hey there wanted to do a quick demo on how we make legal and sales teams work faster together uh, legal teams, they have a bunch of documents they want to keep in their folders. They have their templates that they want to keep maintained. Sales teams, they work in Salesforce. You don't want them to constantly bug the legal teams for where the latest document is or sending the latest NDA out, for example. So we built this little module here. It's going to monitor the account object in Salesforce. And anytime the account object has its legal documents not empty, it's going to go ahead and create the account folder within the uh, repository that we showed you earlier. From there, it's going to create the different documents that the sales rep has requested. And given some parameters, it's going to go ahead and ping the legal Slack channel if there's some things that they need to ask for. So let's go ahead and do that first part right now. I'm going to go ahead and just create a new account here. Let's just call this one Acme Comp. And we're going to ask for an NDA and an MSA as part of this Acme company. Now, right away, what you're going to see, uh, we're going to look at the, the item being created 
Then we're going to generate the folder. So if you see here, very quickly, you saw it up here right here. And then it's going to go ahead, check to see what documents were checked, look at the templates that were in the original folder, and then start populating them here as I talk. And as I open one of these documents up, you can see it's pulling the data from the Salesforce account record. Now, what's really cool is we can offer some human in the loop features. So uh, if I, for example, have revenue greater than a million, I can just add more conditions here if I was a legal team to say, what if uh, employees are greater than a thousand, for example, then I can go ahead and ping the legal team. But other than that, you can see that over here, we're gonna inform the sales team uh, the Slack channel of the various documents over here. Let's go ahead and take a look at our Slack channel that just popped up. And it has all the links to the documents that I selected, the NDA and the MSA. And I have additional options to send forms, send the NDA to DocuSign, do a whole bunch of stuff in the workflow over here. So as you can see here, the legal team, they stay in their preferred application, whether it's their document repository where they manage their templates and documents. Uh, and the sales team, they get to stay in their Salesforce and their Slack. And here we have, almost, we have zero code. We're able to modify things on the fly. And for the Slack channel, people are given extra options to all the documents and uh, processes they have later on. So I hope you enjoyed that. And we look forward to hearing you all. Thanks again. So that was uh, that was a quick uh, preview, you know, of, of the type of things that Tonkin can do. Um, the the important part there was, you know, we we're able to connect to the different systems that already exist, like Salesforce, and in this case was Google Drive. Could have been any CLM, um, old or new, um, to generate the actual documents, but also the communication channels themselves, right? So maybe sales work in Salesforce in um, uh, like to communicate in, in Slack, maybe in Chatter within um within salesforce maybe a legal like to work in email or in microsoft teams whatever it is the ability to to connect to everyone and, and streamline the process through this um flow without actually introducing new applications is is key but also the entire ui where you saw the the the, the, the flow diagram is completely no code and that is what it is there is no behind the scenes other than that that's building blocks is what actually allows you to come with um, uh, to come up with automations and efficiencies uh, on top of you know the, the the tools that you already have and improve the process that that uh, that might be broken. Um, so with that, I think we have a little bit more time to have some questions uh, Q and A. So I welcome um, I welcome questions. Uh, yeah. A quick question came in from Ham Moy. Are, are there best practices for legal operations to follow with building out modules in Tonkin? Yeah, so um, we have uh, we have we have multiple. Uh, obviously, you can visit the website and take take a look at our legal uh, section. We have a lot of examples there and a lot of templates you can uh, you can play with as well and videos to watch um, that are even more in depth than 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 the one we saw there. Um, you can download our ebook. And you know we're very uh, we're very uh, strong on, on on improving legal um, tech as general, and so we have a lot of content and uh, and, and things we we're building it as we work with um, a lot of big big brands, um, and then we also have product um, uh, biweekly product demos, and so there's a legal one coming up, and I think I think we're gonna follow up with um, with with everyone that joined um, with a link, so you're. Be able to join that as well if you want a deeper dive into specific legal where you can also look at some of the demos uh some of the things in the product perfect uh a question coming up from maxwell chin uh looks cool but i can see it being an obvious hurdle here especially when connecting to multiple systems and such or it wants this to have say in technology that our company uses when you say no code am i correct in understanding it will set this up and then we can use Tanki without IT or code. Uh, yeah, so actually, uh, funny enough, we found IT to be um, a friend uh, and IT actually loves us in a lot of times. We don't see this as a one-way street. We see it as a bridge between the business operations and IT slash engineering. And so actually what happens is, if you think about it from the IT perspective, what they care about is stability, 
they care about best practices, they care about standardization, they care about access control. Um, we are SOC 2 and, you know, highly security, you know, Colin, you mentioned most of my team is actually from the intelligence unit in the army. Uh, we understand security very well. Um, and so uh, we we passed the, the most rigid security um, reviews um, in, 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 you know, that actually exist. We work with healthcare companies and financial companies and big tech companies. Um, and so from that perspective, um, we've been we've been vetted, but from a even a conceptual perspective, IT right now, a lot of times, or engineering are a bottleneck and they don't want to be a bottleneck. You know, they want to be, they want to, they want to enable and empower too. Um, if they have, if they can, if they can force start standardization and they can force best practices. So the way we are built and as we sort of like share the information with the IT and, 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 and involve them in, in, in demo as well sometimes, um, they're, they're getting very excited because we enable a lot of best practices for how to build things that are mission critical and, and are scalable, but for a business user. So, you know, you calling in team are not necessarily, you know, learn, learned all the best practices of how to develop software and how to develop scalable technology, but you don't actually need to be worried about that as you, uh, as you build in Tonkin, because Tonkin will enforce it behind the scene. So this is something that is very exciting for IT, um, as part of this. So, so, so it's just a, a follow-up question from Hunt. Like, if somebody's to get started with Tonki and like, what, 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 what kind of, how long does it take, and what, what, what's the, what skill level does a legal person need? Um, so first of all, actually, if I separate it into two, if I separate this question into two different things, if the the, the power of Tonkin is enabling that sort of adaptiveness. So let's assume for a second you do have. Um, Tonkin, building a new um, workflow or um, what we call modules or, you know, changing existing modules um, is, a, is a matter of minutes or hours uh, to deploy changes. It's, it's, it's very quick. We had customers that were able to react to COVID um, where all of a sudden they have new processes that requires new patients requests or customers that uh, we have that had heavy automation with Tonkin around um, external facing customer requests. Um, we're able to spin off new automations and new logic within hours, within two, three hours, and all of a sudden they have now a, a new business process that is that is working. So once you're in, uh, it's very, very, very easy uh, and very fast. Um, as a new prospect, um, it, it really depends on, um, on on how, you know, how rigid your, uh, your environment is. Um, our fastest installations um, were in in in, in couple of weeks. Our um, longest one are a couple of months, and so it's actually quite fast. Assuming that uh, that you can bring the right people to the room, and so if the legal operation teams is excited, and we can bring in the uh, IT or or corp engineering, uh, whoever holds the keys early enough, and get them excited about you know this being a bridge, um, then that can move very quickly with a matter of weeks. A cool. uh, question coming in from Benny. Thanks for the question, Benny. Uh, what legal ops customers do you already have? Um, well, I can't. Uh, I, I can't necessarily share uh, a lot of the names. We have some of them in, in, in the website. We have some case studies. Um, but um, uh, Google, for example, would join us next week on Clock, and would share some of their experience with Tonkin. Um, and so, you know, we're very fortunate with the type of, of, of companies that chose to uh, to work with us, and 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 we've uh, we've able to solve a lot of you know complex uh, problems in a very simple manner. Um, I think the exciting part is when when legal ops starting to use Tonkin um, and start to orchestrate those processes across the different departments. And I'm sort of I'm seeing in the chat that there's continuous questions there. Um, There's two follow -up, good follow-up questions from Benny and Maxwell. Do you want me to? Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, I think the next question from Benny is about you know can it work with different um, business units like sales and marketing and finance to implement? And and actually, what we find is that there's a very little dependency that you need, so you don't have to involve them, um, but you actually a lot of times want to involve them because that sort of becomes this. The, this standardized system for legal ops to work with sales ops. So all of a sudden they now have a shared 
um, place to work on that process of let's say contract um, intake in a way that uh, is really optimized for for both departments. Um, but like I said earlier, the power of Tonkin is that you don't have to do that. You can you can decide that you know if people want to continue to send emails into legal at company.com, you can let them continue to do that and build a Tonkin workflow modules that actually take care of that. And so it's completely transparent to everyone else that there's a Tonkin behind the scene that handles requests. And so most people in the company would, would never even know that Tonkin exists, but in fact, it would take a big a big part of all the processes that, that, that they're participating in. They won't even know it. Um, and so you can, you can definitely involve them um, when, and we've seen this expansion happen again and again, uh, but you don't have to, um, and you, you're not uh, dependent on forcing everyone else or anyone else to change. And that's again, big part of the, the value add. Did you, did you get that follow up from Mac, Maxwell? Uh, it does Tonkin improve legal process to track performance for the rest uh, of the organization? Uh, well, I think, yeah, I think that's part of the visibility question, right? So if you have visibility, um, then now you have be better tracking. If you think about legal, uh, this is something we've heard so many times because so much of the work actually ends up being in, in an email inbox. Um, and a lot of the work is, you know, not only internal, but also external. It's really hard to track and it's really hard to manage too. And um, the, the work, um, especially for corporate legal, is not as transactional um, and therefore it's not sort of like task-based and so on. And so there's a, there, there's a very flexible sort of unstructured work uh, that happens. And when you have something like Tonkin that actually um, enable you to um, automate part of the work, but even if it's not... Uh, automating the work itself and only automate the coordination and handoff, um, you still have that technology basically shepherding the work. And so therefore has the context and visibility into what happens. That allows you to build something uh, like we, we I talked to briefly before, like a live report in Tonkin that gives you visibility into everything that goes through this process, have aggregation on top of it, how long does it take us to handle different type of matter, for example, or how long or how many um, are, are high priority, low priority, high risk, low risk, um, whatever, you know, whatever business metrics I care about, but as well as impacting other um, departments. Because if you think about it on a high level, if you want to uh, measure your sales velocity, and if you're only measuring the conversion between marketing and sales, and you're not taking into account the paper process, and, and how that how long does that take then you if you're a CFO or a CEO or a CRO you're actually in the dark and the ability for for legal to provide that visibility outside it's going to win a lot of um, um, you know organizational points for legal to be able to be uh, an enabler for that sort of visibility in driving the business forward hopefully that answers the question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just, just checking as looks like Maxwell is, is jumping in again. Okay. Um, it looks like, uh, thanks Maxwell. Th thanks. Thanks for all the interaction guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Thanks to the attendees. Or thanks for giving us your time today. And, um, Saggy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and Tonki and coming sharing your experience and uh, giving us a, bringing us on a journey to show us what their product's about, you know, because, you know, we, we have been hearing a lot about it and just wanted to, you know, kind of showcase it to everybody. Um, it, you know, if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to you, Saggy. Yeah, absolutely. My email is on the screen. Um, feel free and happy to, um, you know, have the team shows demos as well. You know, like you got calling and, you know, we're, we we want to help and partner uh, companies, obviously, and we think we're we have uh, something new that is different and has a lot of value, and so um, you know definitely check 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 us out in the website and have any questions. And it's super exciting to start a relationship uh, calling with you and you know and um, any operators. So um, 
thank you for the time and thank you for inviting us. Yeah, and thank you. And I, I'd, say, I'd say to anyone, download download the ebook. It's five ways to minimize change management. You know, one of the the, the biggest things in legal. And then uh, join our legal product demo for you know it's worth it's worth doing the demo to get to get bigger insights. And listen, thanks everybody. Um, I look forward to if if you want to catch up with Tonkin, they're going to be at clock. If you want to demo a clock, they're going to be there. Um, when is that next week? Uh, I think so. Yeah, next week, and, and and you're going to be presenting on a use case with Google as well. So Correct. if you want more information, they can check there. Listen, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, uh, have have a great rest of your day and rest of your week, and uh, look forward to catching up soon. Thank you, everyone.